Welcome to the Writer's Journey Podcast. I'm Michael Laron, a science fiction and fantasy author on a journey to go from nobody to bestseller, and I'm documenting every step of the way. Tune in every week as I pull back the curtain on my writing life and how I'm building a writing career while working a full-time job, raising a family, and attending law school classes in the evenings. You can find show notes for this week's episode, a free starter library of my fiction, and much more at michaellaron.com. Hello and welcome to episode 110. 110 is a good number, and I've titled this episode A Lot of Learning and Resilience. So I guess a fair warning that this is going to be another deep episode. (laughs) I guess it's been a while since I've done a deep episode, so I guess it's about time. It's been about, what, two months since I've, uh, I think I did a therapy episode that was uh, pretty deep. So uh, I just had some thoughts this month or this week that uh, I wanted to share because they were really kind of bubbling up inside that I felt that I needed to talk about. Um, So first things first, announcements. So I released my Writing in Hard Times course. Huge thank you to those of you who enrolled in the course. I offered it for free for 48 hours, and 175 people signed up for the Writing in Hard Times course, which is nothing short of amazing. One of the things that I have to remind myself whenever I do something like this is that Whenever you give something away or you sell a book or you impact someone in some way, there's always a story on the other side. And I think it's really, really cool and really, really interesting that so many people signed up for a course on contingency planning. (laughs) I think if I had, the timing is just perfect. If I had done this course like two months ago, it would have been like 10 people, but that being said, everyone's got their own struggles and dealing with their own things, and so more people are interested in this. And so I sincerely hope that those 175 people who signed up for the course find value in it. Um, and if if you don't find value in it, you got the course for free, right? So I think everybody wins. Um, I gave up a couple days of my time, but uh, like I said, I do this for the joy. I do it for the fun. I do it for the process, not the end result. So hope everyone enjoys the course. If you don't have it, you can pick it up for $149 now at authorlevelup.com slash hard times. And for my win for the week, I have to, I was really, really happy with this. So I picked up a lifetime subscription to the WMG Workshops by Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush. So you guys know I'm a big follower of Dean Wesley Smith. His methods have changed the way that I think about writing and um, have, in many respects, uh, played a bigger part into my success than probably any anyone else. And so I was really pleased when I saw on his website that he was offering the lifetime subscription, which is normally $3,000 for fifteen hundred dollars now that's still a a big sum of money let's just not let's not walk away from that (laughs) my wallet uh, is hurting and um, I think my wallet just got out of the ICU yesterday but I was able to pay it (laughs) and so now I have uh, 73 workshops from Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush that I now have the pleasure of going through at my own pace. And wow, it has been a really great experience. I just finished one today on uh, planning for the future. So how to future proof your writing and your writing career. And um, they were talking about refreshing and renewing your series and refreshing and renewing your career and avoiding burnout. And they were saying a lot of really great things. And I took a lot of notes, about 12 pages of notes <laughs> today alone. And um, the great thing about it was that they were saying a lot of the things that I've already known to be true and that I've already articulated. They were just saying them in a different way um, and, in a, and perhaps uh, a way that was more nuanced that I hadn't thought about. And so I really, really appreciated that. So I'm going to be spending my time going through that. Uh, my lesson learned for this week was uh, from the course that I was taking, and that was how to value a piece of intellectual property. So I had never thought about this, but your intellectual property has value. And that value is not just the royalties. There is a way that you can calculate the lifetime value of one of your copyrights. And so one of the exercises in the course was to do that. He gave us a few resources to look at. And so um, I have a really good idea of what my entire portfolio is worth in terms of future dollars. And I thought that that was really powerful. And 
it's especially powerful when you think about the fact that I'm just getting started. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I've got, at the time of this writing, pretty close to a thousand different intellectual properties um, across my books, across the different formats that I've created for my books. So ebook, paper, uh, audiobook, translations, those sorts of things, um, YouTube videos, podcasts, public speaking appearances. Um, I've got a lot of property, a lot of intellectual property. Like it's it's, it's a lot. <laughs> and so to put a value on all of that is really, really insightful and uh, something I'm very glad that I learned this week and something that I would pass on to all of you. You know, certainly um, I'll drop a link to the course that I learned this in from Dean, um, and I'm not going to give away all of his thunder or any of his thunder for that matter. But learning how to, to value a piece of intellectual property, I've learned the importance of that and how to do it. So that was my... Um, a lesson learned for the week and certainly a win by any stretch of the imagination. And now I wanted to spend the balance of the episode talking about uh, something that I felt like I needed to talk about. It's like 1130 at night here. This is how important it was. Like I started thinking about it and I started taking some notes like I always do with the episodes now. And I usually just read off of my notes when I'm going to talk about what I talk about so that I make sure I keep time and so on and so forth. And it's this idea of resilience, resilience for writers. And what does it take to be resilient? And how can you weather this hard time and come out better at the end of it? And what this episode is not going to be is it's not going to be me talking at you like a life coach saying what you need to do, like you need to hustle, you need to... You need to go out and learn skills. You know, I'm not going to. It's not. I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm just going to share a personal story that I hope resonates with 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 some people out there um, in terms of how I have learned to be resilient. And the reason this came up is that I'm seeing so many people, whether it be at at, at my job or in my personal life, in my community, on social media. I'm seeing a lot of people that don't know what resilience is. Like it's, it's like this, it, it's like the world is ending and the sky is falling and it's, it's, it's perfectly natural and perfectly okay to feel that way. But now that I think we've settled into our new normal, we have to start thinking about what's next. And I feel like there's a lot of people that can't get past that. It's, it's, woe is me. My life is never going to be the same again. I can never recover. You know, it's it, it's kind of like um, um, people when they go through a divorce sometimes where they feel like they can never fall in love again. You know, I, and, and I don't mean that as, a, as an insult. It's just me calling it like I see it, right? Um, and a lot of people angry at God, a lot of people angry at China. You know, I don't think that that's the answer, you know, and I think that the anger uh, is misplaced and this feeling of, my life is never going to be the same, and oh my God, I'm damaged goods, and oh my God, I'm never going to recover. I think that's normal. I think it's natural, and I think it's perfectly okay to be afraid because we've never been through anything like this before. All right, and the reason so this the reason this came up was because my wife and I were having a conversation with somebody that we know who was going through some hard times, and um, we were talking about resilience and. And, and what it means to be resilient. And I, I had some thoughts about some things that had happened uh, over the past few months. And uh, so caution that this may be a little bit long of a story. But in January, back in January, I had a dream. And um, it was a really weird dream. And I don't, I didn't appreciate it at the time. But I, I it was a dream about a, um, a certain time in my life that I really never paid very much attention to until right about now. Um, it was a period of my life that I like to almost kind of forget about. Um, I don't really think about it that much because it it was painful. And quite frankly, the more I reflect on it, one of the more complicated periods in my life. And no, I'm not talking about the time when I was in the hospital and I realized I wanted to be a writer and my near-death experience. This is more complicated than that. This is an experience I've never talked about anywhere. I've never talked about it on Awful Level Up. I've never talked about it in my books, this is the first time I'm ever talking about it. All right, that's how complicated this was, and how 
I've never been able to untangle it. I had a dream that uh, my wife and I uh, lost our house and we were forced to move back into this apartment that my mom and I lived in when I was 10 years old. And this apartment, and you're going to hear more about this apartment in a minute, but this apartment was a hellhole. And I remember thinking about that. I remember waking up and I was like, huh, wow, I, I haven't thought about that time in a really long time. And throughout the day, I found myself thinking about that time, of this time in my life when I was 10 years old to the period when I was 12. And we lived in this same apartment. And I found myself thinking about it and thinking about it. And I had this really odd nostalgia. And I remember going on Google Maps and looking at the, the place where this apartment was. I lived in a, an apartment complex in Spanish Lake in St. Louis, Missouri. So those of you who are familiar with St. Louis, Missouri, you know Spanish Lake and Bell Fountain neighbors. You know what a trying neighborhood that that can be in terms of North County. All right, it's it's wasn't it, it wasn't horrible when I lived there, but it it's definitely gotten worse uh, as the years have gone on. And I had a dream about this place, and I, I found myself on Google Maps and. Um, just looking at all the areas where I used to go, where I, the area where I used to live and the, the, the park that was not that far far from there where I used to walk sometimes and the bus route that my school bus used to take. And I went on Google Maps Street View and I remember looking at all the houses and, and how some of them hadn't changed. And uh, I just remember feeling this intense nostalgia. And I, I, I remember at the time thinking, this there's a reason I'm dreaming about this, but I don't know why? There, there's some significance here. And so I, I kind of just forgot about it. I didn't really think about it that much. And so then um, that was in early January, I think. And so time passed and time passed. And now we're in the middle of this uh, coronavirus pandemic. And I found myself uh, over the past couple of days thinking about this place again. And I thought, okay, there was a reason I had that dream. And so just to give you a a background and, and paint the picture of this time. So this was, like I said, when I was 10 years old to 12 years old. Uh, my mom was a single mom. And up until this point, we had lived with my grandparents and off and on with my stepdad. And both of these places were places where I felt safe and secure. So uh, we were a multi-generational family uh, with my grandparents, uh, my mom, myself, my aunt, and my grandparents all lived in the same house, as uh, many African American households are, and so um, that I, I never really knew what it was like to live without my grandparents. And because of uh, they had to move out of the the place where they lived, and so they couldn't have everyone in the same roof. And so my mom and I were forced to find a new place to live with just the two of us. And it was the first time, really, that my mom and I had lived together, just the two of us. And so um, it was a bonding time at that point. Um, but it was the first time when I felt like we were truly alone when we moved into this apartment in Spanish Lake. And um, this apartment was it was a dumpy apartment complex. And um, to call it neglected was a compliment. <laughs> the landlord didn't care about us. Uh, the building was in disrepair. Uh, there were all sorts of, of maintenance problems. You know, the plumbing didn't work right. And uh, the locks on some of the doors were were a little questionable. The windows were old. And I mean, you name it, a typical dumpy apartment complex, right? Um, and um, there was gang activity everywhere. Uh, it was just not a very safe place to just go out and play. Like go, the concept of going out and playing was not a thing in this apartment complex. You know, the thing I remember the most about this place, and I, and I'll share it because like I said, I'm, I'm just going to share it all. The thing I remember most about this place was the cockroaches. Um, they were everywhere. I mean, it, it, it was unbelievable. Um, just the, the, the extent to, to which roaches can infest a house, you know, um, I'll never forget that as long as I live. Um, now they went by where we didn't probably kill 10, 20 cockroaches and, um, that was that was a challenge. Um, we had a neighbor above that uh, beat his wife every night, and uh, it got very loud. Um, I had a bully that uh, who lived, uh, I think, a couple of apartments down, who decided to uh, he just didn't like me, and so uh, he would beat me up every day after school, and uh, that was a thing. Um, that was a challenge, and um, 
you know, obviously made my mom terrified because literally got beat up every day after school. And, um, it was to the point where I, I don't know what we would have done. Um, we had no money. Um, every day we ate ramen noodles and canned tuna for every meal and I had to eat fast. Like I could, you know, sometimes you eat and then you go to the bathroom and you come back and you finish your meal. Like I couldn't do that because if I did, then I knew that the roaches would be there eating my meal for me. Like, and, and that's not an exaggeration. Like I'm not joking. Like you could not leave food unattended because it would be contaminated when you got back to it. And uh, this was also the first time in my life when I truly understood what racism was. It was the first time I had ever heard a white person use the N word. Um, it was in my fifth grade class. Um, one of the, one of the white, one of the white kids called another kid an N word, you know, never forget it. And I had heard the word up until that point and I kind of had known what it was, but I'd never heard it used and I'd never heard it weaponized that way. And, you know, St. Louis is, is one of the most segregated, um, uh, racially hostile cities in the country, at least here in the United States. And, um, uh, that was my introduction into that. And, um, the, the school where I went to was, it was a mix of black and white, but it was a lot of the white people in the neighborhood were, were, were leaving. I almost said fleeing like white flight, but that's really what it was. Um, and so uh, every year that passed, there were more and more kids in my class that were, that were black and, and fewer, fewer and fewer, white kids. And so there were, there was a lot of, uh, tension and animus, uh, at least among the parents and in the communities, um, where I lived. And so, um, I also got mauled by a dog when I lived here. <laughs> so I was walking home from school one day and I got mauled. This, this just random golden retriever just saw me and just ran at me and tore into my leg. That was a lot of fun. I had no friends. Uh, all I had, and, and this is the only thing I had, all I had was a super Nintendo. I had, uh, a computer that barely worked, that didn't connect to the internet because we couldn't afford internet, and it was an old computer. I had a saxophone, a small toy box, my teddy bear, and a little Casio keyboard. And that's that was a hard time for my mom and I. My mom was a single mom. She worked odd jobs. Uh, she worked nights. And so I spent a fair amount of my time in this apartment alone. And as I think about that, simultaneously, though, as I, you know, like I'm not trying to romanticize like how bad it was. Like as, as I think about that time as well, like some of the happiest times in my childhood were also in this apartment. In fact, everything I did in that little room that I lived in uh, was a predictor of almost the rest of my life. Like for example, uh, playing Super Nintendo and falling in love with video game music. Like video game music is a huge part of my life. I listen to it every day, and that's where that started. Um, I wrote my first fiction stories on that on that little computer that barely worked, um, and I'll never forget it. I used to share them back and forth with my uncle. I I I I had this little Lexmark printer, and I'd, I'd write a little story, and I'd print it out, and then I'd mail it to my uncle, and then he would read it. You know, that's where I started writing fiction. Um, I, I wrote my first songs on the floor on that little Casio keyboard. You know, and um, I read a ton of books on the floor there, and I I learned to excel in school. And I won the spelling bee and the geography bee in the same year. Like all this stuff going on in my life, <laughs> I, I managed to do very well academically, which I look back on it and I don't know how uh, I did it. And so uh, my mom worked nights and, and I was by myself at night. And I remember sitting in the living room window on rainy nights and I would stare up at the clouds um, and I would listen to jazz cassettes. So Steely Dan's Asia album. I probably wore that cassette tape out. Anything Steely Dan. I don't even know how. My mom's not really even a Steely Dan fan, but I had the cassettes. <laughs> and so uh, I learned an appreciation of jazz. And so I I look back I, I look back at that time. And I look back at my life. I look at my life now. And it was such a difficult time, but I blossomed there. And the more that I think about those two and a half years... As I said, they were perhaps one of the most complicated times in my life, and in many respects, in ways that I still can't comprehend. Uh, my mom and I went through a lot, and uh, that experience made us better. But if it weren't for her positivity, I don't know what would have happened to me. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. And now, th the whole reason I'm sharing this with you is that the reason I think I had that dream 
before all this stuff happened. And the reason I think I've been thinking about it a lot lately as we're in the middle of this pandemic and, and isolation and, and quarantine is because I think it was it was my spirit's way of reminding me of something that I had always known but had forgotten. And that is that however hard these times are, I've been through worse. And just like that was a defining time for my mom and parenting me, that was in many respects, uh, leadership unlike I've, I've ever seen, you know, um, this is a defining moment for me as a father, as a husband and as a writer, you know, as a father, I've got a family, as a husband, I've got my wife that depends on me, my daughter that depends on me. Uh, I've got a writing community of people that tune into me every week to hear what it is that I have to say. And that time taught me how to live today. Like, I think that's why I had that dream because I, like I said, I'd never thought about it before up until now. And the moment we, the moment we moved out of that apartment, that was one of the happiest days of my life. I moved out of that apartment and I moved on mentally and I just never thought about it again. And it's so interesting that I think back to that time and how that time taught me so many lessons about what it means to continue to live and to continue to live your life really you know that's that's really i think why it was it was the universe's way of reminding me of what is important and i just wanted to take a moment to talk about some things that i have learned throughout my own life that I think have helped me be resilient no matter what happened, you know, and I think a lot of people don't have that. And I think, I think you're seeing that like a lot of people are really, really struggling. And, you know, we've talked about this uh, the past few weeks, but how resilient are you, you know, and some of the things that I have learned are to focus on what you can control. This whole pandemic thing is out of our control. There's, there's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do about losing our jobs, potentially losing our homes, potentially losing our loved ones. And the first thing that is natural to feel is anger. And then the second thing that is natural to feel is fear and anxiety. But we can't control that. We have to focus on what we can control. And I can't speak to your personal life, but I can say that as a writer, the ability to disappear into a story is completely within your control. In fact, you can disappear into a story where you are in control, where you are the God. You control everything that happens. It's the one constant, I think, in my life right now that I can rely on to have some element of control. And I think that that's important in a difficult time like this. Uh, The next thing is focus on how you can respond. So yes, we can't control what happens to us, but we can choose to control how we respond. I choose to control, uh, well, better yet, I, say, I, I should say I choose to respond with positivity and looking to the future and trying to look for the lessons, which is the next thing I want to suggest, is everything that happens in our lives is a lesson of some kind. You just have to be willing to look for it. I was talking to um, one of my old um, associates that used to report to me, um, and she was talking about um, how her husband had lost his job, and and it was just a horrible situation. And, and she said, yeah, there's a lesson in here somewhere. We just have to find it. And I never forgot that. That was, I think, the true resilience, right? Look for lessons in everything, even in hard times, because if you're willing to open yourself up to them and what they mean, uh, that's how you move to the next level of your life. That's how you become wiser. And so looking for the lessons is important. Um, Having a plan, I think, is also important, even if there's not much to that plan. Uh, My wife and I were talking over the weekend what we would do if uh, the worst happened, you know, if one of us were to lose our job or if, you know, heaven forbid, we were in a situation where we were to lose our home and uh, we are both on the same page about 
what we would do and, and how we would handle it. And um, both of us have a pretty optimistic outlook, um, even if things get really, really bad. And I know that that's difficult to have in a time like this. Um, and I think it's also important to point out that it's okay to not be okay, but you've also got to take steps to move toward okay. It's kind of like if you watch a boxing match, like my great, like my grandfather used to love to watch Mike Tyson fights. And, you know, Mike Tyson would just, just come at this guy and just knock him out. And the other guy would just lay on the floor, like just stunned. They wouldn't know what the hell happened to him. They just got knocked the F out by Mike Tyson, right? And when you get knocked out or you get knocked down, the worst thing you can do is just get right up. You know, if, if you're truly hurt or injured, the best thing to do is to lay there for a minute, figure out what your bearings are, figure out if you've still got teeth, and then pick yourself up when you're ready to do it. And when something like this happens, all of us, like the entire world in the in the span of like a week, got knocked out by like a spiritual version of Mike Tyson, right? And so how do we pick ourselves back up? And it's okay to lay there for a minute if you feel like you need to do that. But at some point, you have to get back up. That's all I'm saying. And I think also that positivity all, always wins. You know, uh, my mom is endlessly positive. Uh, during those times, she always had a smile on her face, you know, when we lived in that little apartment. And I'll never forget that. And, and her positivity always wore, wore off on me. Um, and I think that's, that's why I have the mindset that I have. Uh, and that's why I always, I'm always turning negatives into positives. You know, I'm always turning liabilities into assets. And I, I think I picked that up from her. And that was also an important lesson, I think, that I learned in those hard times. And the, the last thing I want to leave you with is that hard times are not forever. You know, right now there's such a stigma around losing your social status and losing your economic status. Like, that's what people are... are certainly concerned about. And I get it. You know, I, I understand it. You know, but if you look at the most successful people in history, they often had to lose and sacrifice to go on further and get to the next levels of their careers, you know. And I know that that's not much consolation, but it's it's just proof that just because life circumstances set you back, that's out of your control. But what's in your control is what you can do to change your circumstances, right? So we can't control what happens to us, but we can control how we respond. And so uh, I just wanted to talk about resilience this week. It was on my mind. I, I just couldn't help it. You know, my wife and I were talking and she's like, you know, you should do an episode on resilience because I'm talking to so many people and it's really, it, it's, it's really an, an issue. So if you've ever had those feelings yourself that, you don't know how you're going to get through this. First things first, we're all going to be okay. Second thing, you just got to keep going. Third thing, it's okay to not be okay right now, but you got to pick yourself up at some point. And fourth thing, that writing is the best coping me mechanism that we have. It's the healthiest coping mechanism I can think of. You know, I said last week, I just think about all the people that are going through addictions uh, and that are, that are going to come out of this with addictions that they didn't have. You know, and we've got a healthy addiction. <laughs> we can sit in a chair and make stuff up and, you know, we get paid for it. I, I just think that that is uh, a, a really remarkable thing. And so I hope everybody is well. I hope this message finds you well. Uh, I hope something that I said this week resonated um, with you if you're having feelings of anxiety and fear, because I know that I still have those on a regular basis. But th these are some of the things that I don't know that I've articulated in the past, but that I turn to to help ground me during this time um, because I, we're going to get through it. And so hope everyone's well. Like I said, stay safe, and I will plan on hollering at you next week. Thanks a lot for listening, and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for joining me this week. If you enjoyed this episode, you'll enjoy my backlist episodes at michaelaron.com slash podcast. For your free starter library of my favorite novels, join my fan club by visiting michaelaron.com slash fan club. If you're a writer and want to connect with me further, check out my YouTube channel, Author Level Up, for helpful writing advice at authorlevelup.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back next week.